Hello friends, it's Rob here. Hope you're doing well, hope you're keeping it together. Today we're gonna to mix it up a little bit. So this might come as a shock, but as well as playing drums, I also happen to be a big fan of music. So I've decided that I'd like to talk more about music and the things that I enjoy. So what better way to kick things off than a bloodbath like a discography ranking? Today we're gonna to talk about one of my personal all-time favorite bands from Norway called Ulva. They're, at this stage, they've they've done it all. They've had, to me, one of the most enviable careers, like particularly after recently um, reading through their biography and getting more into the nitty-gritty of just how they've lived out their life as a band. It's just to be able to touch on so many genres and do them extremely well and still, like, and still retain, like, a sense of their own identity rather than just, you know, bouncing from one thing to the next and just sounding like 20 different bands. They somehow still manage to sound like them. And it's just, they're one of those bands that just ticks, they just tick so many boxes for me. So I thought, like, let's, let's just have some fun. I'm going to rank all their albums in their discography. Not all of them. They have so many releases in different capacities. And look, it's just, given how varied the whole thing is, it's just... It's like how do you how do you rank these and also like how do you even what you know are you, can you put them all in I don't think so so what I'm going to do is focus purely on the albums that story their artistic growth which sounds kind of kind of weird and esoteric but like given all just the little bits and pieces that have turned up along the way I think this is a good way to sort of narrow things down a little bit now th this isn't really necessarily like you know a metric that you would apply to most bands like Slayer for example the thrash album the thrash album the thrash album the thrash album but this is this is the criteria that I'm using to add the releases to the list not how they get ranked. It's obviously subjective. So I'm just gonna, but I am just gonna go over what I have chosen to not put in the list rather than pouring over every single little detail about what they've put out. To, to be frank, if you're gonna go that far, you would just do a full-blown documentary and I'm not the guy for that job. But I do recommend getting there. If you are a fan of the band and you want to take it that step further, do get your hands on their biography. It is so good. They've actually, it's the, the biography is just, it's just transcriptions of uh, conversations between the band and an interviewer over, and they just basically tell the story of their career. It's so good. At the end of the day, just remember, this is just some guy fizzing over one of his favorite bands. So one of the releases I'm not including is the covers album, which is called Childhood's End. Um, now look, the, they do say quite a lot about the influence of psychedelic music, which is the, the focus of that album. Um, you know, they do say how much that has influenced their style over the years, but they are not their songs. So, it doesn't really add much to their story as a band. And if I'm not mistaken, um, Torda, I hope that I'm pronouncing that name right, um, he even sat that album out. Like he, I don't even, when they performed it live at Roadburn, which is another album I uh, haven't included, um, I don't even think he played the gig. I think, I believe on the day, I think this is in the book, I could be wrong, but um, I think even on the day, he's just like, eh, not, <laughs> not feeling it. Uh, drone Activity is another one that I'm not including on there. And that's actually a sick release. I really enjoyed it. First half is just rock solid, a just great immersive listen. And then the rest is, you know, it's still pretty good. Um, but once again, like that drone work ha was sort of already fairly well documented across their career. So that's an example of why I wouldn't include that one. And I'm also not including the live at the Norwegian Opera House uh, album which i love that album like that's to that's set once again like you know given how diverse their discography is you'd be pretty hard pressed to put together a set list that good that really acts almost like a best of coupled with stuff that they could actually you know pull off live like granted i'd probably swap you know i would personally swap a couple of songs here and there but it's pretty friggin' bang on and you got those the two um, uh, piano pieces that bookend the performance, which are just hit you in the guts. There's, they are phenomenal. So it's got, and it's, there's lots of little, 
little spins that they put on the tunes throughout it. So once again, fantastic listen. But how does that tell the story of the band? Not so much. And once again, they're songs that they've already done. So hence, I'm not including that one. But phenomenal. Let's call it an honourable mention. As far as the studio EPs go, um, I've very much picked and chosen which ones. I think the only one I've left out is the Sick Transit Gloria Mundi EP. I think I'm saying that right. Uh, Sick Transit Gloria, yep. And mainly because it's, I think it's mainly just B-sides from the assassination of Julius Caesar and, uh, and a cover song. So once again, doesn't really add a great deal to the, the body of work. Funnily enough, that as I sort of like worked on this list and um, was revisiting all the releases, towards the end, I actually wound up pulling the Riverhead soundtrack, which I actually really like. Once again, it's sort of like, you know, it's very droney, very subtle and soundtracky and all that stuff. It's got this great subtlety to it, you know, very, and you know, that mood that Oliver have just become quite exceptional at over the years. But as I listened to it, I just kind of felt like it didn't really slot in. And when we're talking about what's what shapes the journey i did attempt to track down the um the uno soundtrack um and i'd sort of you know did my best to try and do like a, a bit of research on it like what exactly was it was it stuff that they composed was it in collaboration with other people um you know i found one track that had their name on it and it was you know, like it was pretty cool um but you know i you know I, I didn't exactly exert myself trying to find out what was going on with you know that release i don't exactly see people jumping on forums going the uno soundtrack is the fucking bomb goat level ulva number one sorry i didn't worry about it uh another one <laughs> we, we're gonna get to the list i promise we're gonna do the list it's probably because i don't want to like get to the end it's like you left out it's like we, we're gonna do take care of that now um, I might chuck something in the description if you want to just skip to the list. I've also dropped out the Sun and uh, yeah, the Sun and Ulva collab, which is fine. Once again, more drone work. That's what that's already been sort of you know documented. And it's like it's pretty good. The first track is sick. It's like super dark and menacing, um, as well as the second, third one kind of falls off a cliff. Just not great. Man, there's a lot of opinions and we haven't even hit the list yet. But anyway, the, look, the, the omission of these releases is no statement about their quality. Like, for, for example, like, I would actually put the Riverhead soundtrack over some of the releases that are in this list. But um, anyway, this still leaves us with a hearty 17 releases that we're going to pick apart and say regrettable things. And look, even, even up until, like, today... Like, I, I still change things around. And I think there are things in here where I could do this a week from now and it'll change and I could do it two weeks and so on and so forth. But, you know, can't we just have fun on the internet? Let's go. Number 17 is Natens Madrigal, which uh, has a subtitle. Hang on, let me practice my Norwegian here. Otta himne til ulven i monden. Don't know what that means. Something along the lines of eight hymns for wolves in the wolf in man. The wolf in man. Let me find this out. Yes. Ah, audible Duolingo. Thank you very much. It's paying off. It works. Okay. Well, this one's kind of obvious. This is not the album that got me into the band, or rather, the style. Super harsh production, and kind of to be personally, it's kind of an odd choice because between. You know, like I felt like, you know, when you talk about this whole quote unquote um, black metal trilogy um, that some people still fawn over, it's like I felt like they said everything that they needed to say on um, Bergtat. So uh, it's kind of an odd choice to just to go full black metal on the third release and like, and and I've got nothing against black metal. I enjoy black metal. I enjoy probably more like, more so like the Emperor side of things and, um, Transylvania Hunger is something like I get a lot of enjoyment out of, but they really went hard on just making this unlistenable. But to me, it's also just a thing where like, it just didn't feel like it was bringing anything to the table. Like this came out in 97. Like what did the scene really need at that point? 
I mean, I could I could see how like after doing like an all acoustic folk thing, you want to follow up with just like an epic contrast. But but like, can you imagine though if like they kind of already had like the shift to electronic music lined up, so they've just gone and done like the ultimate black metal thing as like a troll? Like, I mean, clearly like this is not why they did it, but like, can you imagine? As far as harsh black metal stuff goes, and it's your thing, yeah, cut sick. Number 16, we've got Feldsanger, which I'm going to just, let's keep going with like the translations. I'm going to say it's uh, like night songs or something like that, or night singing, evening songs. Nice. Look, acoustic stuff. It's nice. It's got a vibe. You know, I'd call this like an admirable attempt, like considering where they're sort of coming from, you can appreciate that. But like if, um, if you want to chuck on some scando folk kind of stuff, just go listen to Mirko. Like totally listenable, but not exactly what I'd call a go-to. Number 15, we got Bergtat. Now this one, like I said before, I, this to me, this captured everything about the Black Metal Trilogy and did it better because it had all of the above and it was like a lot, li it was a lot obviously more listenable than Nartens, but you could, but it still had the low fineness and, you know, and to the level that creates the ambience that I get the enjoyment out of that raw black metal kind of sound. Um, you've also got those hilariously gigantic toms as well with like, like you hear it like that opening, uh, the fill in the opening track where you've got the dead ass snare, <laughs> but the giant toms, you've got like, da -da 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 and I tell you, <laughs> And the opening, and that opening track as well, like that has that is such an iconic uh, riff. Like you know, even you know something like Transylvanian Hunger, where you know you just hear that riff and it's just like you remember it straight away. It's one of those riffs that kind of tells the story of the the early '90s black metal thing, and this kind of more melodic and I don't want to say listenable, but like. Let's just go with melodic. Uh, almost like, you know, I don't want to say progressive, but, you know, progressive in a different way. Um, you know, more thought out approach, I think, carries a lot more weight historically than, you know, something like Nartan's Magical, which is just like harsh black metal. Okay. This is one that I've, you know, I enjoy a little bit more each time I chuck it on. Number 14 is the Metamorphosis EP. Now, this one only lands so far down the list by default because of what I had to sort of put in front of it. But you can't tell the story of the band without talking about this EP because this is where they make the most dramatic shift by far. You've got the black metal trilogy and then this, which is like you have some full-blown like dark techno sounding stuff, but also that sort of dystopian soundscapey kind of stuff with you know the trip hop grooves and all that kind of stuff which lays the the groundwork for Perdition City and I think if I remember correctly that even in the liner notes there is like uh, a note that alludes to them of, ma of making the continuation to the Perdition City album and speaking of the liner notes they even had to go so far as to include like a paragraph that essentially distances themselves from the genre like basically saying like i don't know in, in basically getting in front of trolling and just being like we're not doing that anymore we're doing this now shut up and stop whinging in advance which is uh you know fairly gutsy you got to hand it to them but anyway uh i i mean uh, there's not really much to, to knock on this release, but I'm fairly certain that like, the, my enjoyment is predominantly derived from nostalgia on this thing. I'm a little bit sort of blind to, you know, if, if there are any shortcomings, um, I've got a blind spot for them. Number 13, I'm including the Zodiac album or, uh, um, <laughs> so, I almost did not include this one on the list because it is essentially a just a, a jam live jam out album. But when I revisited it, I you know I once again, you know I enjoy this one once again. I enjoy this one a little bit more and more. 
the more I listen to it, but also this kind of live jamming kind of phase of the band is it is part of the story. And I think and this release is kind of like that first big statement of it. I think there's like part of me like as a, as like as a musician myself that doesn't really put a lot of stake in this kind of rock jamming thing just because you're kind of aware of how easy it is to just kind of just get up on the stage and just fuck around with a vamp and like if after not playing live for like 17 something years and you finally got the chance to see Ulva and they kind of just jammed on riffs for like 90 minutes I'd be pretty fucking bummed out I gotta be like it's it's kind of cool but you look like if you got this instead of the the set list from the Norwegian Opera House <laughs> But nonetheless, this is a perfectly enjoyable background album. You know, they they take selections from from their discography and use them as the basis for these improvisations. And they they're cool. The track uh, "Chromagnosis," I believe it is, is like for a repetitive just for just sitting on the same thing for as long as they do. It is super sick. Like just. I'm just air basing just the whole time. It's just, it's a wicked groove. I, I, I got to give it to him. And the, the live version of Nowhere Catastrophe is like surprising and mega sick. This is, you know, I mean, as we speak, part of me wants to flip this with the Metamorphosis EP, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a meteor release. Put it that way. A quick fix of melancholy is at number 12. I'm not even quite sure what you would call this one. You know, that's even like a little bit of part of the if, of the problem, if you were going to call it a problem. This is just essentially just, it's just a small offering of experimentations. But to me, I find them to be quite high impact. There, You've got like, the, I mean, to me, it's really a, all about Vowels and Little Bluebird. They, they're much more opera centric and I, that's the that's a thing where I kind of wish that they just lent into that for for the whole EP just because it's just it is just enormous it's unique but I guess when you factor in the sound of the other two which still use like uh, strings and or an orchestral sampling I don't know whether it's things that they've programmed or sampled speaking and just to go back to that biography like I was surprised quite taken aback by how much they actually sample which just goes to show you just how creative they are with you know with what they do and how they're able to blend it so seamlessly with all their stuff but to weigh up the two pairs of songs that are, that are on there I'd say drama is kind of the, the through line you know drama in a sort of a theatrical kind of sense which is sort of a bit more on the nose with like you know the big operatic kind of stuff and the two you could say instrumental tracks it's sick, like easily enjoyable. If anything, I just wish there was more. Number 11 is War of the Roses. Now, as I was listening to this, it didn't occur to me that I actually didn't check out this album for many, many years after it was released. And I can't for the life of me recall why, you know, with the last album being um, Shadows of the Sun and considering how much I enjoyed that album, I'm not quite sure why, you know, I wasn't just like, new album, let's go. But anyway, I think it was when I watched the, uh, the the Opera House DVD and they played a song off that album. I think that's what prompted me to, to, to go back and, and have a look. So here is what I would call the start of the Daniel O'Sullivan era, right? So what does that mean? Like, so, I mean, obviously, you know, he is the, uh, the UK born uh, member of the band who, who joined uh, for a time, excellent musician. And I would characterize the sound of the band in that time by the uh, the kind of the jammy sort of vibe and the more implementation of more um, organic instrumentation across the board. I kind of find that like the his way of arranging instruments kind of has more of the feel of many layers and many instruments, right? Occurring all at once. And even though... Ulva is very dense in like the amount of layers that they have. When you have um, Torda, who I believe, um, you know, stepped back a bit on this album, like he was present, but he stepped back quite a lot. 
the, the productions that he's more heavily involved with, there's layers and, and whatnot, but it just feels like one great big heaving mass, right? Whereas like a lot of Daniel's stuff, which as a side note, I understood a lot more after listening to a lot of his solo work, which is phenomenal, by the way. And I encourage you to go and listen to it. Um, I am, you know, you know, despite my preference for you know, other eras of all of his work. I am a huge Daniel O'Sullivan fan and a big fan of uh, a lot of the output from this period. But I feel like there's stuff, particularly with this album, where sometimes it sounds like another band doing an Ulver impersonation, which <laughs> that sounds like mega shit. At the same time, you know, these detours are what make the band really fascinating. So... So I think if you go and check out Daniel's work, it'll make a lot more sense. Like, for example, you've got the track Stone Angels. That is essentially a Daniel O'Sullivan song, not just the fact that, you know, he's the one reciting it, um, you know, being a, like this extensive poem, but even just the way that it's uh, composed and produced. I think that is a lot more in line with what he does than what Ulva does. So... And I, th I think there's like some documented tension between him and Torta and yada, yada, yada. And like, and not just those two guys, but like, it, you know, it seemed to just be a very turbulent time for the band. And now I think around this time, you've got touring involved and all this other stuff. It's sort of like all these little pieces start to make sense. Like, you know, and another thing, you know, I think uh, I recall reading that like there was, this album was like kind of rushed. So... You know, you almost start to see why they avoided touring for so long. You know, when when they're a studio band, they're able to just kind of just do their thing and not have the pressures of like, oh, you know, album cycles. So, and there's many instances where you can kind of hear how things were kind of rushed. But before it sounds too much like I'm kind of like shitting on it, um, which I'm not. I mean, like, you know, like I, I'm pointing out these kind of points of critique. I think it just makes it easier for me to sort of justify this kind of ranking thing. And let's be frank, like just talking about how awesome everything is all the time is kind of fucking boring. So like, um, but shitting on stuff is like not cool either. So I think it, I think it's way more fascinating to talk about, a, a, you know, reasonable observations. Anyway, let's get the compliment sandwich going. Uh, Thomas Pettison, uh, the drummer on this album, is sick. He just brings so much like fire and spice to these tracks, a lot of diversity and approaches. Very, very cool drummer. And just, I don't, he, he's one of those dudes that just sits right on that, that red line, you know, where he's just, just being very exciting, playing a lot and adding like just enough almost a little bit too much but in a really cool way he's got these particular phrases that he reuses quite a lot which i'm totally stealing i mean like a, a great example is like you got the track norwegian gothic where he has this it's a kind of weird it's in it's it's in time to a pulse but it's like totally freeform it's like when you've already got so much going on and you've got melodies and what have you going on and you, you kind of need a backbone there but the drums are just they're just being l let loose and it is so easy for that stuff to just sound like absolute dog shit but he nails it and that's I think that's kind of the payoff like when you go into that kind of territory but you pull it off it is really sick and I've got I've got to take my hat off like I think I think to do that thing really really well is that you have to have like a, like a musical ear in the sense that you've got an awareness for what's going on around you and how to play in and out and around it and, and respond and react accordingly. I think it's when you go, cool, like I'm going to cut a drum solo and <laughs> like, and you know, what did you think guys? Like, and where, you know, you could have just put on a click track and it wouldn't matter. So, um, create credit to him for, for, you know, I mean, across the board, but that, but to, to pull that off, I thought was phenomenal. And, and while we're at it, like, um, you know, this, 
it's strange. Like, you know, this album has some of my some of my most favorite, um, you know, moments on it, like the track um, Island, like, which is not Ulva at all, but there's just something, um, you know, really beautiful about that track. And I think given that that song is, if I'm not mistaken, written about what was going on at the time, like just, just the... Uh, you know, that turmoil between everyone is just executed really wonderfully. So I think when you have those moments where just things are, you know, despite some of the other uh, shortcomings, in, when something's genuinely inspired the way that one is, um, I, it just it just nails it. It just nails it. It's such a good song. But if we're going to talk about like, you know, some of the rushed aspects of it, you know, you've got things like um, these kind of random just big freak out sessions. So you've got like, like the, the track September 4, which is like, it, it would probably one of my favorites, like that sort of first half, I could just listen to that on a loop, like just such a beautiful melody and chord progression and the way the vocals interact and weave in and out with the piano is just stunning. But then it kind of like just, stops and then goes into this just random psych jam freak out and but you got like this the lyrical matter which you know it's it sort of invokes this image of like like an old village where you've got like a you know like a young boy dying from an illness and being you know surrounded by his family who, who sort of have to watch this happen and then like and then psych jam freak out so it's like, is, is that, what's the story? Like, does, you know, is, is all is lost? So they just like, just eat bags of mushrooms and freak out. Like, I don't really quite get it. But Horses for Courses. Another one, you got the track Providence. So you kind of like, not my favorite. Um, it's kind of dreary three, four, you know, swaying kind of thing but once again random jam section except i fucking love this jam section this kind of like just sort of up tempo three four thing it has it's got like nothing to do with anything with this mad bass line in the background and it just keeps building and building and building with like like just all these horns in the background and i think like a i think it's like a soprano sax solo or something like that um it just kills. It just absolutely kills. Um, like I'll I'll just get on the kit and I'll just skip to that part of the song and just jam on it. Just have a blast with it, and then and then it just ends. Like and they sort of just add like a uh, like a line from the song and and that is it. Um, you know maybe it has like a kind of significance um, with the lyrics, but. Um, um, you know, I, I'm yet to experiment with just cutting the jam section out of Providence and adding it to the end of September 4. I keep thinking about it. Um, I kind of just wish they, they, like those four chunks were just their own songs. But anyway, and look, I, like I'm aware of the, the, the hypocrisy, like of, of the thing, you know, I'm, I am good for people just kind of just tacking something on. You know, if it's sick, I, I don't really care if they just don't have anything to do with each other. Yeah, I think it's when it sounds tacked on, that's the problem. Like take, for example, you got the song from Shadows of the Sun, Let the Children Go, right? You've got this big percussive jam out in the middle of the song and then it kind of ends with this climax. But everything in that song builds to that jam section, right? I think it's sort of... It's 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 still telling the story, and then as it builds, dun, 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 bah, and then you got the epic, you know, the, sort of the epic final stanza of the song, um, which wraps it up neatly. So that's a good example of you know, yeah. Ugh. So this is the this is the album that I will chuck on when I've kind of cooked every other album, and I still want to listen to Alba, but I need just you know something fresh it's like ah oh, i haven't listened to this in ages um and i will enjoy it um i think it just the reason it falls so far back in the rankings are just the, the elements that are uh, they're a clear product of the haste in which this album was created but let's 
Compliment Sandwich. Good album. All right, number 10 is Messe. Messe? Messi? Shit. Messe. Messe. Okay, number 10 is Messe. I hope I'm saying that right. This is getting really hard at this point with the rankings thing. If you've, <laughs> if you've seen the movie Killing of a Sacred Deer, this is like the final scene. <laughs> If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. Um, story time. When Ulva came to Australia uh, and they performed at Dark Mofo in Tassie, I um, went to see him and they performed this in full. And I thought, how good am I? Um, I'm going to get in really early and get my tickets front row center, but just completely forgot that like, well, not for, so much forgot, but just didn't take into consideration that when they perform this thing, it's, it's performed with an orchestra and there's like the three of them up the back uh, doing their, you know, all the electronic stuff. But they like, there's like a big mesh screen that's like at the front of the stage and they project all this mad imagery on it. And it kind of looks like just these apparitions sort of appearing, right? But when you're up the front, you're kind of like this and you can't really see the cool shit. So I probably should have been about like halfway back. So that was a bit of a fail. It was cool to be like right up the front being able to see all the musicians and, you know, what have you. But yeah, I lost a lot of the effect there. And you add to that, I just, my body decided that this was the time that I was going to have a coughing fit. I don't randomly just get coughing fits, although I've, you know, and, and this is probably what happens to that guy when you're at a movie or a concert like this and he's like Ugh! and so and I didn't want to be that guy so I'm just like holding it in I'm just like, yeah. and I'm like my eyes are going red I'm looking like that that guy from the meme who's got like the just the, the veins protruding like out of his head like I probably just looked like I was getting really emotional because like my eyes are red and watering and like waiting for like a loud bit so I could be like you know and um so yeah not enjoyable like it was still amazing, but it's like, it's one of those things where like you finally get to see like one of your favorite artists and then just, you know, you, you've, your, your body just finds a way to, to ruin it. So um, didn't ruin it. I'm being a bit dramatic, but you, I think everyone has that thing where they finally get to see one of their, I don't know whether it's like their favorite artist or go to a place and just everything has to be perfect. It has to be like this big come to Jesus moment. Um, and it wasn't. So I did have this period where like listening to this album was just like, oh man. Um, but this is a work that was commissioned in collaboration with uh, conductor, composer, arranger Martin Romberg. And it was performed, I think this was originally performed with the Tromsø Chamber Orchestra. Let me check. Correct, as usual. And now this is, and it's not just like a recorded live performance. It was like the performance and there's a lot of post-production as well, which is, a, I think is a very, very cool approach. Like not just being restricted to how it was on the day. So that yields for a lot of very interesting results. This album leans a lot harder in the orchestral direction. You take the um, opening track, which is as Syrian, fuck, I have to look this up. It's such a long, one of those long time names. As Syrians pour in Lebanon, Lebanon, I'm so sorry. As Syrians pour in Lebanon grapples with, fuck me, can I get the whole thing here? As Syrians pour in Lebanon grapples with ghosts of a bloody past. That's the, that's the name of the opening track, which as a whole, as a whole, it's amazing. But like that, that whole closing section is so emotionally intense and you know that and probably possibly one of the most emotionally intense things out of their whole discography if like if hearing that doesn't affect you you are a fucked human like you have to be broken inside not to feel something when listening to something like this it's so amazing i want to i want to say that like i may have like shed a tear at the performance but as we've discussed you know, i may have just been just choking but but just just actually choking now, now, granted, like, you know, previous albums have utilized orchestra, or, you know, orchestral instruments and strings and all that kind of stuff, but just sort of in various capacities. Like, this is the one that I think you would you could point to as being their symphony and all of a album, you know, rather than sort of the typical approach where it's kind of flipped, where the, the symphonic thing is complementary. 
Instead, they've taken full advantage of the situation and the results are amazing. So you have this kind of, you know, like a dark orchestral um, journey, which goes through a lot of different moods and intensities and and has, uh, there is one track that sort of uh, leans a bit closer towards the minimalist and uh, sample-based glitch kind of thing, which they've, they've done in the past. Um, kind of caps off with a track that's like, it's a little bit too... Um, 80s uh, 80s ballad for my liking like just it's just the way it kicks off it's a little bit too Hollywood um, end credits music for my liking which like I don't know it's like considering how like raw and like emotionally raw and severe and deep um, you know this whole thing is this is it's kind of a little bit um on the nose it kind it, it takes you out of it it takes you out of it i think that's probably a way of putting it it's like it's not bad per se but like it kind of just like it's just like that splash of cold water and i'm just like ah okay it just kind of it just takes the edge off for me so like no that bit's it's not bad just no number nine teachings in silence so I, I, it's just easier to take silence teaches you how to sing and i'm sick album title or EP, whatever, and silencing the, silencing the singing and just, you know, they, they released it later on as Teachings in Silence. Um, it's just easier to slap the two together because they both kind of document that minimalist era that they went into. So the you've got Silence Teaches You How to Sing, which is like a single, I think it's like maybe 20 to 25 minutes long uh, track. It's extremely minimalist very glitch based very long and droning and um just goes through all these like you know different you know different te it's more textural texturally focused but still goes through you know goes through in and out of these kind of melodic uh kind of moments um i love the outro just that very strange um harmony that's kind of that high harmony in the background it sounds like someone else is singing it um, but yeah, it's just very odd, but they don't take those moments too far. Like they still keep things subtle and just, there's these kinds of like blips on the radar as it, as it goes along. And then you've got the silencing, the singing, which, uh, very, very repetitive, very, um, almost meditative kinds of tunes. You know, they don't even especially take the builds all that far and like granted like you know i might only enjoy this on a background level but i think even still like for a, for a even for a backgroundy kind of thing that doesn't usually function that way i still find myself in it you know which is for something that's so repetitive uh, that is impressive that's very impressive like something that just sort of it takes you in and it keeps you there and you know whether it's you know when you listen to it enough you know there's no anticipation to be had um i think when something is just so successful in creating a mood and keeping it there it's uh that's dynamite that's some good shit so while this isn't as 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 grandiose as some of the uh you know the other releases in this list i just cannot go past an album that really takes me takes me somewhere and this album does it in in fucking spades number eight flowers of evil this one on the list as i was making it just like a just like all over the place like i just did not know like i would sort of stop and think about it and be like, yeah, maybe it's like here. And then I chuck it on and be like, oh, wait, wait, this is this is really good. Um, I think I feel like this is like a good spot for it. We've got here Ulva's most recent studio album. And the first one that is basically a continuation of one of their sharp turns. One of the most favorite things about this band was whenever like a new release would come along, you just you did not know what you were gonna get, and every time you were just blown away so this is the first one that's just like oh okay well we're still doing this okay and cool like they still do like a, a fantastic job and it's not the same per se to be fair like every time like a new all the studio album came out like you you really like you felt you felt the earth move like they really took it 
you you never knew where they were going to go. Like I remember, you know, when before Blood Inside came out and they released like an MP3 sample of Christmas and um, just putting it on and just it just ripped my skin off. Like I was just absolutely just it's just like here, like here we go kind of thing. And it just like absolutely captured, you know, it captures your imagination, especially when, you know, they, they were coming off the back of like doing all that glitch minimalist stuff. But to be real, like I, I wasn't overly surprised that they kind of stayed here. Usually when a band hits like their, their kind of like pop phase, they don't usually, they don't usually budge. It still makes efforts to distinguish itself from the previous release. I feel like this one breathes a lot more. There's a lot more separation with the instruments, for example. I get, I get a feeling that like this album gained the most influence from all the touring they were doing. Like sort of listening to it, it, it has the sound of, not necessarily like it doesn't have a live sound per se, but it sounds something that is much more um, easier to replicate in a live setting. As if that was, you know, that may or may not have been a, a consideration when making the album. Perhaps playing as a band um, for extended period of time up until this point has kind of made them feel like think more like a band as opposed to a, uh, a project. I feel like on this one, vocally, it suffers the most from what, what I could, would call being a like lyrics first kind of process, right? So what do I mean by that? So, I mean, for example, you've got like, um, I believe his name is Yawn. Uh, you know, they have a member in the band who is essentially a dedicated uh, lyricist who collaborates with Christopher. Um, like, I, I, I believe he's still in, you know, he's involved in the music stuff, but like his um, his wheelhouse is, wor is words. Like he, re he releases poetry and does, you know, these, um, uh, recitations and things like that outside of the band, right? So that this this process of like shoehorning your lyrics into melodies and things like that can kind of fall prey to these um, like Toto esque Serengeti <laughs> like lyrical moments. And like and look, they have like cropped up here and there across previous releases in the form of like some kind of like awkward sounding rhythmic choices but I think with pop music which is is much more melodically constrained because you know the way things have to be more uh, you know it is more vocally driven uh, they the melodies tend to be a bit more focused so that removes a lot of uh, flexibility with um, your with your phrasing so but if you're sticking with your lyrics and you're sort of having to cram just too many syllables while you're still trying to make a sort of repetitive consistent sounding melody it can get kind of awkward not to mention using perhaps syllables that might not sound especially effective in a in a given moment right in the same way though if you were like melody first that has its own drawbacks. For example, you know, it's like, cool, here's the melody, here's the sounds, like even the, down to the sounds of the words that you, you that you need in there to make work, you get some very questionable lyrical choices. So it's, it's not one way or the other. So is this album played with it? No, it's not. But did I notice it on this one more than other ones? Yes, I did. But it's still a really enjoyable album. Even leading up to doing this video, it kept bouncing back back up the list you know with and it's like it is it is by far the album that's taken me the longest to get into I think there's just that element where you know when you've been a fan of the band for such a long time and there's like a new LP coming along and you you've suddenly lost that experience of just like oh they're doing this again okay all right, all right fair enough so you know that's that in itself is you know can be it gets you I think it gets you off on the wrong foot and the more I listen to this album, I think I'm just not sold on the placement of the opening track. I like the opening track. I can see why it was picked, but 
it kind of like, you know, the core, it's not a massive chorus when it gets there. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of bare sounding. And like, I love the song as a song, fantastic. But, you know, it's like, it builds at the start. Great, you know, great start to kick off an album, but then you kind of get, but then it kind of just cruises. And, you know, I love the outro, like the jammy outro. That's fine. That's cool. But yeah, I'm, it's not sure as like a, you know, kick off the album. Track two, sick. Such a cool track. You could have just drawn out that intro just a little bit further and just kicked off the album with it. How good. That is a ripper. Speaking of that song, I think that's Russian Doll. Um, like the like the chord, the, the reharmonization in like the second verse where like they add in like those, you know, those fresh chords that just totally change the vibe of the song. It's just they pull that off unbelievably well and um killer chorus you know in fact there's killer choruses back to front on this thing like it is incredibly enjoyable but you know, I, I feel like i've just dwelled far too much on those like like those 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 criticisms um it is a great album i like i said i, I mean i won't be surprised if, if i did this again 12 months from now and it is way way higher up on the list um that all and that drum sound as well oh my god is so good he is such a sick drummer sated eva thormod sated i hope that's right um i believe he also plays on the assassination of julius caesar uh, i believe he also played yes he also plays on the assassination of julius caesar great drummer just right in the pocket but just adds just little things here and there little, little bits of spice i love that they've got him and thomas in their discography it's these very contrasting uh styles of drummers i love what they both bring to the releases that they perform on just mad grooves mad sound but once i mean look at where it is on the list it's a great album i love it at number seven blood inside this is a fascinating one because like the more I come back to this one over the years, it's the more, it's one that takes on new life the more I listen to it, which makes makes a lot of sense given like how much the sheer volume of information in this re release. So this is, as I mentioned previously, comes off the back of their, uh, their glitch work that they've done. And it's kind of like they went from like, okay, we'd, we've done the minimalist thing. Now we're doing the, the maximalist thing. Like it is just, it is suffocating. It is gigantic. Were, it's almost like they were making up for like lost time in a way. I also find this like this through line of the album where the, these themes of like um, ambulances and hospitals woven in with like all this like um catholic imagery to be unbelievably fascinating just like how just as a choice it was just so intriguing to me you know and still remains to me and you know when i sort of thought about it it's like well you've got like hot like the like hospitals and like you know catholicism and it's kind of like well you know hospitals are they are a kind of like a kind of purgatory you know with purgatory predominantly being uh to my understanding a catholic construct that kind of makes sense so just very very fascinating so once again it's epic it's dense it's layered it's like i could i could picture like the 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 computer trying to play back like everything that's in it and like sh like smoke like, pfft, like sh shooting out of it while it's trying to like process all of the information in it like even like there's some ballad kind of quote unquote ballad kind of songs on here which still retain that unbelievable like density like you know there's like the song uh blinded by blood which is um you know like this kind of large vibraphone progression with um you know the, all these choirs and whatnot in the background and it just like you sound like you are immersed in blood something viscous and you're kind of just but as if you're falling through it the whole time um and i think that density and that feeling is what is consistent even though the, the release itself goes in a number of different directions that is the consistency of the album. 
blood inside. I wasn't even sure what to make of this album when I first heard it. Um, I just knew it was dark and epic. But now, actually, when I when I listen to it, I can actually hear. Actually, it's closer to like a psychedelic prog kind of thing. But once again, like I don't even think that does it remotely enough justice. I think even at this point, the more I talk about it, the more I wish I kind of put it higher up in the list. Well, too bad, so sad. I'm not going back. Number six is Svidnasia. I love this soundtrack. Very much has the the Ulva sound and it has the... It has the film score kind of vibes, but at this point, we finally get to hear the maturation of their compositional ability melded with the textural glitch stuff that they've been doing, blended with the the orchestra. Naturally, like we, we had these sounds on the silencing EP and the melancholy EP as well, but this is the this is the real deal. Like this is the kind of rubber meeting the road. Now it, it does have that kind of piecemeal soundtrack vibe where it sort of you know jumps around a bit. Um, but you know this is not really how this material is intended to be digested. But to me, it still very much feels like a journey start to finish as it is. Every time I chuck it on, it still it still feels like the first time I'm putting it on. And once it's one of those things where you put, you, after everything they've composed up until this point in time, you chuck this on, you go, oh, right, they're amazing at this as well. This is ridiculous, God. Number five, Lycanthropin Themes. Another soundtrack. This was for a short film. I think you can find it um, on YouTube. It's pretty good. There actually isn't a great deal to say about this one. It's like, it's one of those ones um, similar to uh, say like Silencing the Singing where it's just, it does its job unbelievably well. But I think what kind of separates it is how this has less of that piecemeal kind of sound. It's something that you can enjoy from start to finish quite effectively. Um, it sort of has like the a consistent sort of motif that it keeps returning to throughout it. I love the sounds. I love the textures. It just, there's not a lot, there's not a lot to say about this one. I just love it. Number four is the assassination of Julius Caesar. It is getting really tricky, particularly at this end of, you know, cause you've got, you're starting to get these albums that are so completely disparate in their approach. So you, you kind of, it's a bit of a crapshoot, but you know, you do what you can. They could not have timed this, this album any better. Like right, this was like right in the thick of all that just 80s revival stuff, this is synth wave and like what have you, except this album, very, I find, lacks the derivation that a lot of the bands of this style were, were, were coming out with. Not that there's anything wrong with that. This still very much sounds like an Ulva album and um, Torda's present is very much felt here. This almost feels like a, a return to form in a, in, in a sense. You know, once again, describing the, the production style and instrumentation of Torda, where it's like it is it is like a unified front in its in its in its sound compared to before it was like a little it was kind of more busy um, as opposed to dense this might be the distinction that you know you would make between Torda and Daniel but obviously over are a collective but these are the distinctions that turn up when you're examining the discography I feel like one might be able to offer up a better analysis of why these things sound the way they do but I think simply just doing an a b of works from these errors it makes a bit more sense once again no criticism to me I just think all of the sound is defined by what Torta does and then when you hear this album you go oh yeah that's right now if you've heard this album I know what you're thinking hey so falls the world random this is almost like a spoiler but like random techno section which is so sick so you've got like this kind of um kind of like lurching lumbering kind of you know um groove halftime groove with like this you know very sort of like you know, once again moody kind of like you know piano thing you know it very feels much like you're walking through the halls of like a like a giant like almost like a, a marble palace of sorts um with like 
like there's like no roof and there's but it's and it's like night that kind of thing and then it kind of is like this little build and then suddenly just like techno like and it's just like it's like so sick and i think it even does like the the providence thing where it like gets to the end and then it just like does some like chords from the start of the song and then washes out I don't care. It's amazing. Obviously, I mean, obviously it's subjective. And you've also got there's a jam, at, you know, this big jam out at the end of the album as well. But I feel like contextually that makes a lot more a lot more sense. You know, the way you know the the, the song you know grows and kind of builds, and it very much like it kind of wraps up the album as well in a, in a neat sort of way. Um, you know, if I keep making references to like these sort of like end credits, you know, kind you know. Uh, uh, kinds of songs and um, and the way it sort of flows into the jam and sort of just whew, like it kind of just like you know just peters out you know in a, in a way um, super cool I'm about it but jam no jam if it's sick it's sick there's you know there's, there's no blanket rule but there's no and beyond that there's not really much else to say about this album but like all the songs they just feel incredibly strong it's like it's like they just established a groove and just nailed it to the fucking ground and then trimmed all the fat off off the vocals off everything it's just super super rock solid release number three was essentially my introduction to the band and it is themes from william blake's marriage of heaven and hell now, given that fact, you know, it, it gives one pause as to how much nostalgia plays into the enjoyment of this release. But every time I come back to it, I'm just, you know, I, I, I am taken aback by just just how ambitious this this particular, you know, this particular album is. And just given the you know just how creatively free these guys were and um and unbelievably like pretentious as well to be like yeah we're gonna take like this whole work of blake's and make an make an album out of it but like shit like they pulled it off in spades and not just like how ambitious it is but it's just incredibly like ironically enough for appropriating someone else's poetry into into something it's just it's incredibly unique in like i don't know i don't have anything i've never heard anything like this this album nothing sounds like this album you also have the first release with Torta um, and also the uh, previous guitarist um, uh, Horvard is still in the band so you you know you have this um, you know the overlap of the old and the new in a lot of ways um, this offers more of a transitional point than what was to become the Metamorphosis EP, which was, you know, their, you know, their statement to the world of we are, you know, we are this new uh, entity, we're doing this new thing. Um, to me, this is a bigger statement of that because you have these, you know, these elements at play. And it's like, I, I wouldn't even know how to describe this element. I mean, because you have the, the old and the new happening, it, you could... Um, refer to it as industrial but even then that conjures up you know your ministry and your nine inch nails and your skinny puppy what have you and it's just like that just ain't it to me it's like it almost has like a musical theater kind of vibe in the sense of like because of the way like they've they've just you know created these vignettes in the, in the same way that Blake would with um, his poetry like you know he would um, you know these you know each work of poetry would be accompanied by a like these um these plates that he would um create these accompanying works of art with so perhaps in that sense that's where they've derived this approach from where like each um each work has um yeah has the feel of a vignette but also the, the the use of different male and um female vocals and you know chris in particular um really exploring his range in his register and the way he sort of colors particular lines with harmonies and stuff it's it re very much has the feel of like of like theater where you have different characters walking on and off stage and props and sets being moved around and and also like hats off to like um Stina I believe her name is um I can't get enough of that voice and I we I I'm going to do a bit more research into like her output after this particular album because just beautiful 
just beautiful. Now, like I sort of sometimes internally criticize the second disc. So this is a two CD thing because it kind of feels like you're taken on this amazing journey, this opus of the first CD, and then it gets to disc two and it's kind of like they've got made it all this, done all of this work. Like, oh, and then it's just like, they're not even close to the summit and it's like there's all these words left. So the first song on disc two is like, it's like this 11 minute thing and it kind of feels like they're just bashing these lines out. But in fairness, I have come back to that track and I, I do like it more and more each time. And, you know, perhaps they're sort of trying to confine things to, the, no, because if you look at the marriage of uh, heaven and hell, like it's all divided up in these different works. You know, this is probably a particularly long piece and they're keeping, they're sticking to it. And also like there's like instrumental stuff on the second disc. So like they, they could have crammed words in there. So, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let them off. I'll let them off on that one. And also like friggin' Proverbs of Hell, that was the song that originally got me into them. And it's like, you know, that's like a nine minute song. And it's like, it's got like the verse chorus kind of structure. The poetry itself is sick. It is the it's it is probably their most unique release out of their entire discography. Just amazing. Number two is Perdition City. This is something that is like to me for what it is, which is like the the kind of the film noir kind of soundscapey thing. Probably the most perfect realization of this style. Like granted, you know you've got like your Portis head and your uh, like you know Boron and a Club of Gore, but like. You know, they, they to me they they're a little bit too derivative. Like for me, this this captures the sound and the feel perfectly. Although the the, the Dead City Centers thing is a little bit too on the nose. You know, it's like welcome to the underworld. Like it's that's a little bit silly. And there is like a like a soundtrack thing in the background of that, which is like absolutely been used in Ren and Stimpy. So like you hear that, you just go, oh, well, cartoon, we're in cartoon land now. But like you could like, you know, maybe like, you know, if, if I was going to do it, like, <laughs> like have that like in a, like a coming out of a gramophone in the background or some shit, like sort of rather than being like, pff, like front and center. But that not, you know, that notwithstanding, like it is, it, it's me, it like, it is a perfect album. I still listen to it to this day. It is like a 20 plus year old album, I think. Nowhere Catastrophe, like what a killer closer. Once again, like has this end cre scrolling credits kind of feel, just like blam, nailed it. But if we're gonna talk perfect albums, number one, Shadows of the Sun, like surprise, surprise. I was even gonna just say, get it out of the way at the start, just be like, you know, whatever. Even throughout the reading the biography, they just keep coming back to Shadows of the Sun, like just as if like that is just the yardstick for, um, you know, if, if anything, I'd like to hear from, if anyone, if this is not your favorite Orba album, I'd love to hear about it. And granted, if like, if you're completely, you know, if you're just all about like their pop stuff, I could see how you could be disinterested in something like this. But if you're a fan of the band and their body of work, and this does not, this, this one is not at the top of your list, I'd love to know, you know, if there is a why, I mean, you just, you like what you like, but yeah, but please let me know. So if, if you were to characterize Oliver's true sound, despite like all the eclectic shifts and turns throughout their discography, to me, it would be their command over mood and atmosphere. And I think when you, you go through so many dramatic shifts and are playing with genres, eventually you're going to, you're going to land on a mode that is going to be most conducive to that ethos. So I'm, I'm not one for, honestly, for like sad or depressing kind of music. And I have a lot of trepidation about describing this album in that fashion. I would, I personally find this album to be very like introspective in the sense of like, so like you know, something that's like sad and depressing is it's kind of, it's very, you know, inward in a sense, but which is like, it's like, well, you just said this album is introspective, but like, I, th I feel like something that is introspective is something that it's, you know, introspection tends to like, uh, beget examination, you know, which is where you, you then will look, you look outwards. And, and I think that is thematically what this album is about. It's, you know, it's about, you know, all the big picture stuff about, you know, life and death and you know our place in it so you know what 
better configuration than you know than with string quartet and you know the the blending of percussion in in the way they do they introduce they sort of maintain that that drum sound like the gigantic drum sound but in an orchestral gigantic kind of way and also just the most sublime use of theremin i've ever heard like it just this very glassy almost vocal quality in place of say like what would probably typically be like say a lead violin kind of thing and naturally you have like these piano uh you know to me the piano takes the center stage like it's it's like the front man like yes you have christopher on the album who, amazing performances uh, across the board but to me, he's kind of more like the messenger, like, you know, the, you know, almost like a narrator while the piano is like truly the, the protagonist, the, like the carrier of all of the weight and emotion and the voice of, of this album. There's, no, there's not really much more to say. I, I remember, I still remember as clear as day finishing this album. The album concludes with a minute of silence. And I just remember just being stunned, like just, you know, just in awe. And like, you know, it's like even just realizing, like, oh, Jesus, like just, just so overwhelmed, you know. And, and to this day, I could just put it on and it's as fresh as when I first heard it. Just an absolute masterpiece. So that's that. I really, uh, I hope you enjoyed that. You know, I, I, I personally do myself enjoy just listening to people who just, you know, even if it's stuff that I know, just like pulling it apart and offering their angles and analysis on it. Um, and re regardless, I thoroughly enjoyed doing this. I think I put more work into this than any high school assignment or project or anything along those lines. And I plan to continue doing more of these, um, look, deep diving into... Um, you know, the discographies of some of my favorite bands that have like these extensive um, discographies. Like to me, this is more, it's more the deep dive. Like the, the ranking is, is just kind of a bit of fun, but, um, but just, but I think the ranking is what forces you, it really forces you to go that extra mile and kind of justify your position. And that makes you go and find the evidence and the arguments and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, it's a lot of fun. Once again, let's try and not weight the, the criticisms too heavily um, because, you know, this is, well, this is my favorite band. I'd spent like, you know, like a good few weeks <laughs> preparing this so if you have suggestions i'm i'm i am open like i mean because granted i'd like to just talk about shit i like but uh the, but the prospect of like of the challenge of like hey here's this artist who has this ex extensive discography um no zappa please please no like <laughs> no i love zappa um but too much too much and there's some shit in there like there there is some there are those are some criticisms that will be um, quite rightly leveled um, at some of that work. But anyway, um, but yeah, I, I would welcome that challenge, particularly ones that like I'm, I kind of dig, but just haven't gone all the way with. So um, let me know, um, get some discussion going in, in the comments, subscribe and like, share, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm looking forward to the next one and seeing you next time.